Okay, welcome everybody. It's time today for a new session of Virtual Compromit High Tech Forum organized by IFAM. Today's session is dealing with micro precision manufacturing and processing. The session will run from one until three o'clock and there will be six talks and, and every speaker will have 15 minutes for the presentations followed by five minutes for Q&A. Before we get started, I would like to mention that some people are watching the session via live stream on YouTube. And if you want to join the discussion, you would have to register for the Zoom webinar on our eFarm website. Yeah, let's start with our first talk. We are pleased to welcome Mr. Dennis Lehnmann from Germany. He works as a system engineer and is responsible for product development at Berliner Glass. The Berliner Glass Group is one of the world's leading providers of optical key components, assemblies and systems, high quality refined technical glass, as well as glass touch assemblies. And today he will be sharing his expert opinion on optical micro alignment in medical product development. With that, I ask you to give your full attention to Mr. Lehnmann. Thank you. Now everyone should be able to see my presentation. Yeah, everything looks good. Great. Well, thank you, Ramon. Um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dennis Lehmann. I work as a system engineer at Berliner Glass uh, in the business unit medical applications. It is a real pity that we can't see each other today in person, but I hope you are comfortable in your home office and you have 20 minutes full attention for the intriguing topic of optical micro alignment in the context of medical product development. But first, a few short words on my employer on Berliner Glass. We are active in various markets of the light using industry, for instance, semiconductor industry, which is the reason Berliner Glass was recently acquired by ASML. Um, but the whole range of medical fields as shown here is covered by the business unit medical applications. We manufacture, for example, dental scanners, endoscopes, or also smaller sub-assemblies for which optical expertise is required. As an OEM supplier, we provide complete solutions, starting with uh, product uh, development and ending with a stable series production and satisfied customers. We can even take care of the certification according to the medical device directive, uh, if this is required by the customer. Um, basically, there are only two things which we will not do. We will not bring our own products to the market and we do not provide engineering services without serious production. But now, back to our topic. As a strategic investment several years ago, uh, Berliner Glass developed an, a platform solution for optical alignment, um, which is shown here in two images. You, you see the, the platform which consists of a stabilized granite table on top of which a granite arc is placed. This arc is, is movable and it consists of a pattern of, or it offers a, a pattern of threaded holes to mount actuators, fixtures and measurement instruments. It is um, therefore possible to quickly customize the platform for any alignment challenge. Yes, also your next alignment problem. And the platform is compatible for small series production as well. So we are able to start manufacturing of um, in series production while the dedicated tool is being designed and being manufactured. So this allows us a, a quick start in, in manufacturing. 
yeah, some uh, examples of actuators and um, measurement instruments are um, shown on the right hand side. And for each um, alignment uh, problem, we also need the, the software to match the, the measurement and the actuation to achieve um, to achieve our alignment goals. And I would like to show you today three examples of micrometer precision alignment um, of optical components on our platform, um, which will show you the, yeah, the versati versatility of our platform and uh, the, um, all the possibilities which we are able to cover in, in this way. And firstly, um, on image sensor alignment on prism assemblies. And the second case is lens alignment for high performance optics. And the third case, which I would like to show you is an experimental tolerance analysis of an optical device. So first alignment of two or three or even more image sensors. Why would you want to do that? Well, for example, um, this is necessary in a three chip camera, a three chip camera, which uses three image sensors and uh, color separation by dichroic coatings instead of absorption filters. So no, no light absorption takes place in this, in such a camera head and this yields an improved light yield and also an improved um, spatial resolution because there is no debiring uh, required. This is one example. Another example um, which is seen um, very often recently is um, the topic of functional imaging. This is the overlay of two images, typically a visible image and an, another kind of image which show, shows you um, some bodily functions and um, the most uh, well-known uh, example is ICG imaging in which uh, a green fluorescent is, is added to and um, which allows the the surgeon to to see the the blood flow in the in the in the body so you see here an, an endoscopic image on top of which the fluorescence image is projected but there is a vast difference in intensity between the visible image and the fluorescent image and this makes it necessary to acquire the image on two different sensors but of course the focus of these images must be equal and there can be no image rotation or lateral shift whatsoever because this may cause errors in, in diagnostics. So it is therefore necessary to align both sensors in six degrees of freedom and with uh, for the lateral and the image rotation requirement it is necessary to do this uh, with single pixel accuracy. So this may be down to the to one one micrometer. Now, how do we achieve this? Uh, we configure our alignment platform as uh, shown here. Under the platform, we have an illuminated test target. Mm, in the central hole in the table, um, as you see on the right hand side, we have an imaging lens which focuses the test target in our uh, assembly, which we now have to align. And um, on above the um, imaging lens, you see the prism assembly, which splits the light into two colors in this case. So the Im imaging lens focuses the test targets on two uh, sensor planes. Now um, we have the, the sensors um, 
attached to the hexapod actuators and these hexapod actuators can move freely in six de degrees of freedom and we can use um, these hexapods to align the, um, the sensors. Now before we can start aligning, we of course need to know the position to which uh, these sensors must be aligned. So for any alignment problem, there is a measurement uh, task to be solved. So the image sensors are connected to the camera system and the video screen is, Im is imported in our alignment software. And on the left-hand side, you see now the images of both sensors on top of each other. The image of the first sensor is shown in red and the image of the second sensor is shown in green. Now, we have uh, various structures on the test target. Um, for example, the, the line gratings or Ronchi rulings to detect the, the image contrast. And this is used to focus the sensors. And we have these structures in all the image corners to be able to, um, to measure the, the sensor tilt as well. Uh, the, the accuracy of our measurement uh, depends um, basically on the depth of field or the F number of the imaging lens, but um, focus uh, in the range of 10 micrometers can be achieved and an, Im an image sensor tilt in the range of 0 0.2 degrees can be achieved. So these three degrees of free freedom can be um, adjusted on the base of the focus measurement. Uh, and now we have position markers as shown below uh, for the rotational and the lateral alignment. So in each um, sensor image separately, the position of these markers is evaluated. And this can be done with a precision of uh, even better than one tenth of a pixel accuracy. And this um, allows to uh, compensate the um, image rotation by yeah, one thousandth of a degree is even possible, um, but in any case better than 0 0.005 degrees. So the, the three, these three degrees of freedom can be aligned on the basis of this measurement. So this is the way we can achieve the sensor alignment. And now next, I would like to show you the lens alignment. Lens positioning is often the limit, limiting factor for the performance of optical system, um, optical imaging systems. The surface tolerances um, are not that critical. They can be manufactured very precisely. And the task for the lens positioning or the centering of the lens is that the optical axis of all elements must coincide. The lens axis of a spherical lens, as shown here, is defined by the centers of curvature C1 and C2 of the, of the optical surfaces. Um, and the lens axis now must be aligned to the reference axis, which here is uh, defined by the, the rest of the optical system shown in gray. For centering tolerances below 10 micrometer decenter and below two minutes arc, uh, two arc minutes tilt, it is not possible to do this alignment by mechanical mounting. So you need some kind of alignment process. Now, how can we achieve this on our alignment platform? For this task, we use a different configuration. Um, attached to the bottom of the table is now an autocollimator, uh, a measurement instrument on a linear bearing. This is for the lens centering measurement. And above the table on the left is the hexapod used to align the lens. To, and the large mount uh, to the right is an adjustable fixture for, uh, for the optical system into which the, line is, uh, the lens is to be aligned and the, these systems can be 
fairly large. And the setup is uh, completed by a control software and um, it is used to assemble a complex high performance optical systems. Now, um, on the lens centering measurement, um, we use an, the autocollimator, which has um, an illumination. The illumination is focused in the point um, and uh, in the plane of focus, the, um, the centers of curvature C1 and C2 of the lens can be measured. And then we can uh, move the, the autocollimator and by moving it, uh, the focal point of the autocollimator describes a line in space, which might be slightly curved, but it must be highly reproducible um, because we then need to calibrate uh, this line to, um, to form the reference axis for our system. And then um, we have a, a perfect reference axis and we can um, move the outer collimator to the plane of uh, center of curvature C1. And we can use the, um, hex the hexapod to adjust the lens. Now, these were two examples of um, alignment processes. And now as a third case, I would like to show um, yeah, an, a tolerance study, experimental tolerancing study. And we consider a litro monochromator. This is a spectrometer mounting where the entrance and the exit slit are very close to each other. A spectrometer is a device which splits the incoming white light into the constituting spectrum according to wavelength. And this is usually done by means of a dispersion grating. The spectrum as indicated on the slide is um, imaged on the exit slit. And the narrower the exit slit, as you can see, uh, the, yeah, the higher is the spectral resolution. Um, but this is at the cost of the light throughput the light throughput, the intensity of the system. And this is the classical trade-off in spectrometer design. Um, yeah, and in our case, to as avoid dispersion by imaging optics, a parabolic mirror is used. And especially for, for short focal lengths, these parabolics are notoriously hard to align. And aiming for a simple design and quick assembly, the question was raised on which now, which performance can be achieved based on mechanical tolerances without active alignment. Now, spectral resolution and light throughput are not part of the standard, standard merit function of the optical design softwares. And even after tolerance modeling, it is not obvious that the theoretical results can also be matched in practice. And uh, seeing that we have three critical components and we also have three hexapods on our alignment platform, we decided to perform the tolerance analysis in this case experimentally. So we attached these critical components, the slit, the parabolic mirror and the, the grating to a, each to a hexapod. We also mounted the illumination and the detection behind the exit slit uh, to, the, um, to the fixture of the, of the slits. And then we can perform the measurement for the light throughput and the spectral resolution as shown in the graph. Light throughput is shown in blue and spectral resolution in red. And then we can perform a scan, for example, a rotation of the parabolic mirror. And you can see how the intensity depends on this rotation and the spectral resolution. How does this look in practice? We have mounted all the components and the fixtures to hexapods. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm afraid that you are out of time now. Great, then I will skip the next slide, show you all the graphs which you can use for this experimental tolerancing and um, and give you the short summary of this short presentation. Um, so I've just shown you the modular alignment platform, which is quickly adaptable for any new project. Uh, we have various actuators and measurement instruments. And I've shown this um, by means of three cases, image sensor alignment, lens alignment, 
and uh, an experimental tolerance analysis. Thank you for your attention. And if there is any time for questions, I am happy to answer them. On behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank you for the most interesting presentation. Um, we have reached the end of, um, of the time slot and we need to move on to our next speaker. So if anybody has questions for the speaker, there's your option of answering them himself using the Q&A function. And answer this question you can view via the Q&A field. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you again. And our Thank next you, speaker Francis. is Christine Kallmeier, who works as a group manager at Fraunhofer Institute for Reliability and Microintegration, IZM. And the Fraunhofer IZM is one of the world's leading institute for applied research and the development and system integration of robust and reliability electronics. And today she will be talking about flexible circuit boards for medical devices in the European medtech community. And here I'd like to turn over to Mrs. Kalmeyer. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, So today I will uh, try to uh, give a pretty broad overview over different uh, flexible substrates for an even broader um, area of, of medical applications. Um, it will be difficult in the shortness of time, but I will try. Can you um, switch in the presentation mode? Ah, sorry. Thank yeah, you. Of course. So I will start with a short motivation or explanation why flexibility, stretchability, and drapeability are so important, especially in the medical sector, and then show technologies to produce flexible and even textile substrates um, for medical uh, applications, and then end with a few example projects for the different technologies I showed before. So what we see as trends for wearable and implantable medical devices, devices currently in, in the projects we are working on are on the one hand, still the, the e-textiles uh, where we started from, uh, but not so much anymore for, for complex sensing, more for, for movement monitoring, for stimulation purposes, and also other treatment uh, purposes, for instance, light treatment. Um, the, the more complex uh, applications like ECG, for instance, or EMG um, are currently more focused on new, new kinds of patches um, made of, of stretchable electronics for local complex sensing, also with high density electronics integrated, which is uh, harder to realize in, in textiles. Then there's a new uh, area coming up, the swallowables, as we call them, diagnostic devices, for instance, like camera pills, where also ultimate miniaturization is required in order to make them swallowable. So flexible substrates are key here as well. And another um, area which is very important has already been shown uh, in, the, in the last presentation, smart catheters. So digitization in the tip of the catheters by using miniaturized packaging technologies like flip chip, like new high density uh, flex and flex to rigid substrates, um, which enable things like intravascular ultrasound, for instance. And the highest requirements, of course, have chronic implants, for instance, for neural stimulation, uh, what we also know as uh, electroceuticals or bioelectronic me medicines. And all of these applications uh, require uh, either flexibility of the, of the electronics or even stretchability, if it has to be more compatible to the tissue or drapeability, for instance, if um, the, the application uh, is a wearable device. So these mechanical properties of the electronics are key to realize um, these products. And therefore a lot of different flexible and textile substrates um, are required with different properties for the different purposes. Of course, still the, the standard polyimide flex, the conventional polyimide flex, uh, which is used for instance in hearing aids, um, uh, is, is still the, the most 
used uh, material here in these areas, but there are new technologies coming up and new technologies required for the higher requirements of the applications I just showed. So instead of, of using the, the conventional flex substrates, we see a, a trend towards high density flex produced on wafer level. And this is an example for this process. This process exists in, in many different places. This is the process, process at ICM. And here, uh, line space of uh, smaller than uh, 10 micrometers are possible. So 10 microns line, 10 micron space can be realized. Um, the line height is about three to five microns and multi-layers are possible with embedded passive uh, components. So this is the key to a very high degree of miniaturization in a lot of our applications. But we can even go one step further and uh, use these same materials and embed uh, active components. So chips can be embedded in these multi-layer thin film flex substrates. Um, of course, these chips have to be ultra thin. Uh, typically we use uh, chips with 20 micron uh, uh, thickness, but even 10 micron thickness have been uh, shown already. And uh, together with the high density routing uh, in this flex, you can have also very high density miniaturized um, parts that can then be integrated in, in a coarser patch, for instance, um, if you want to have a, a multi-sensor patch for ECG and, and other parameters, for instance. So the combination of, of these different technologies is often the key to solve a, a problem. And in, in this case here, of course, uh, talking of uh, miniaturization, the, the overall thickness afterwards, including the dyes, is around 50 micron or less. So it's extremely flexible. You can hardly feel it um, even on the most sensitive areas of the body. And another interesting development based on the same thin film technology has been uh, done by TU Delft together with Philips. This is uh, this flex to rigid technology, F2R. Uh, there we can have rigid areas with integrated MEMS components, for instance, or integrated um, capacitors, like in this case, these IPDs. And on top of these rigid structures, uh, which are separated by trenches, uh, this mul uh, multi-layer flex is uh, generated with the thin film um, technology. It, in most cases, uh, polyimide is used, but in the um, project position, for instance, we have uh, also tried to replace the, the polyimide by other materials such as pyrolene. And this allows functional rigid islands, which are held together by the uh, routing flex, uh, to be folded and, and brought into a three-dimensional shape. And thereby, therefore, it's really interesting for um, applications like the smart catheters. It's key to realize them at all, I think. And this is an example of the, um, what such an F2R uh, substrate looks like when it's produced. So the orange Parts here are the flexible parts, and in between you have the rigid islands with the different components integrated. Besides these high density uh, flexible substrates, um, often stretchability is required. Therefore, we have developed um, many years ago uh, a process to uh, produce polyurethane based stretchable circuit boards using standard. PCB manufacturing technologies, um, which is shown here in the sketch, but I won't go into detail. So it can be easily transferred into industry and has already been transferred. And you end up with a substrate um, with properties quite close to um, the properties of human tissue, of skin. And it's ideal to realize uh, patches and patch-like uh, products. And it can also be uh, applied to textiles after um, being produced and assembled. We can also in the meantime, um, make TPU stretchable uh, substrates with gold metallization. Also here, because of the restriction of time, I won't go into detail on the process, but um, 
in the end, we end up with uh, a stretchable TPU, gold metallization, and an embedded ultra thin chip um, inside the TPU. And this would be ideally suited to generate soft, very small uh, chronic implants. And that's something we are currently investigating in European projects, how this soft uh, encapsulation in this soft substrate work uh, for chronic implants under the harsh environment inside the body. If we go again to the, to the outside of the body, um, there are a lot of wearable ap applications which require uh, textile substrates. And this is one way to generate a textile substrate. We call it text PCB. It's a very simple process. And in the end, um, you end up with uh, non-conductive textile carrying textile conductive structures. It can be stretchable, it can be more rigid depending on the base material you use, whether it's knitted or woven or a uh, non-woven material. A lot of different properties can be realized and it's cost effective and large areas of this can be produced. I will show um, examples how it can be used in medical later on in the examples. And if you have even larger medical applications where you have to distribute sensors and actuators over the whole body, basically, uh, you need uh, another approach. You need textile ribbons or bus structures which can be distributed over clothing um, to add these uh, sensors and actuators to uh, and, and produce the, the smart garment, especially for, for rehabilitation purposes. The examples how we use these different, very different substrate technologies, um, I will show now. Starting with the uh, intravascular ultrasound catheter, I showed the uh, F2R process earlier, and this is what it looks like when it's rolled up afterwards. So this is the, the smart tip of the IRIS catheter. Um, here you can see the rigid uh, parts you had seen earlier in the picture, but now rolled up. And uh, behind the smart tip, you have an electronic module with the attached uh, uh, flip chips and uh, passive components. So only with this technology, such a, a small device that um, can be used intravascular uh, can be realized at all. Um, the TPU we use, as, as I said, um, with the gold metallization can be used directly as electrodes um, uh, in implants. Uh, here we have especially developed a, a nanostructured gold surface to improve um, the, the contact to the nerves. And in the future, uh, this will be uh, done together with integrated electronics for um, building electroceuticals, but this is still under investigation in the European projects right now. Again, the F2R technology has been used um, in uh, the Excel project Informate for this DBS probe. It's quite similar to the intravascular ultrasound tip. Uh, you have the segmented areas here. Uh, with a flex in between and uh, flip chips are assembled on a rigid part that goes then in the middle of this rolled up um, electrode array that you can see here. Outside you have these electrodes, inside you have the electronics in form of two flip chips. It's maybe better to see here in the cross section. Uh, so the overall uh, diameter is 1.3 millimeters. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> not very easy to see anything at all because afterwards we um, uh, encapsulate everything, of course, in silicone. Also here we need a, a soft encapsulation. We cannot afford a rigid encapsulation for this kind of um, product. And also here it's still under investigation what kind of layered structure is optimum uh, for a soft encapsulation for chronic implantation. Um, in the project position two, uh, we are investigating a little simpler 
um, uh, electroceuticals at the moment that can also be realized by more conventional flexible substrates. Uh, in, in this case, we use an LCP substrate, conventionally structured with embedded um, electronics, which will be implanted pretty much directly under the skin um, in this area here to treat chronic cluster headache, um, which uh, yeah, is called suicide headache because of a, a reason, but only uh, of, yeah, is 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 rare, but still, it's it's a big problem for the for the patients, and it could easily be treated by such an uh, electrical stimulation implant. And a lot of other implants can be done in a similar fashion. Only in most cases, they need to be much smaller um, if you want to treat high blood pressure or pains in other uh, other areas of the body with uh, the similar technology. Then you need. Uh, smaller products with embedded electronics, uh, for instance, cuff electrodes with embedded electronics that go right around the nerve. And this still has to be developed. Uh, as I am running out of time, I will skip this patch and go to the next patch directly. Um, uh, sweat sensor, sensor patches have seen a lot of interest lately. This is one example, and it shows also one of the problems we have in, in patch development. This would be possible much smaller and much, thin, much thinner if we had access to all the dyes in, as bare dyes or in wafer form. But if you don't have millions of parts, you have to live with um, conventional components. And this is um, yeah, what such a realization of a, a patch looks like at the moment. But um, of course, we have uh, from our partner Exensio the chip as a, as a bare dye, and it is assembled on a polyimide flex and encapsulated also in, in silicone. And at the moment, we are still in a reliability investigations, but it survives uh, more than two weeks. Uh, in the meantime, I think in saline solution without any problems. And it's not uh, meant for such a long time, so it will only be worn for a couple of days. And um, for the uh, distributed uh, applications over the body, we have a nice example of a, from a European project called uh, Refream. Um, this is for treatment of stroke patients. And we built using our text PCB technology novel um, textile EMG electrodes padded to improve the skin in, uh, contact that has been a problem for many years. Um, so we have a very cost effective uh, process to, to make a very flexible and stretchable uh, garment um, with, with stimulation electrodes. And this can be seen here. So you have stim stimulation electrodes and the wires uh, that connect them with the electronics distributed over a, a very tight fitting uh, a knitted garment. Okay. Sorry, but you but you have only one minute left. Yes, conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> okay. because the, the last application was quite uh, similar. So I, th I hope I could show that flexible electronics still enable innovative medical products, just because the flexibility uh, offers new possibilities and, and um, the electronics can, can be applied in places where it couldn't without the flexibility. Um, we have always to look at the requirements in me medical products. They are so much different from other microsystems. And of course, there are still unsolved challenges, especially regarding the reliability, um, especially for implants. If we have flexible systems, we have to think in a complete different way. So system level means here, we also have to think about the mechanical construction. What is the 3D shape uh, going to be afterwards? And we have to have a, a mechanical and electrical co-design um, in, in order to make the optimum uh, out of this, out of the products. And what we see already, it's not only an outlook, we see it already that we have to see all these technologies as building blocks and we can, can combine them freely. Um, for instance, thin film and stretch and 3D printing. We can combine variables and implants and get again, completely new products and uh, achieve new properties. So this will be the future to, to use this as, as building blocks um, to create completely new ideas. Thank you for your attention. 
Yeah, um, thanks a lot for your presentations. Um, let's start with one question I have. And what about the certification for the very different materials, especially for biocompatibility? Yeah, this is a, has been one of our major problems through all these years. Um, there are even uh, material suppliers uh, that refuse uh, to make their materials available for medical products um, because of the regulations that had, have already been mentioned. So there are by now a lot of material suppliers that see the, the possibilities of, of the, the, this market of medical products. So we see more and more certified um, materials as well. But uh, it, it still is a problem. If we find an, a perfect material for an application, it still can uh, turn out that the manufacturer refuses to make it available for, for medical products. So it, it's still a problem and I hope it's going to be solved, but with the regulations getting worse instead of, of um, uh, making life uh, easier, I I don't, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but at the moment we have quite a lot of suitable materials available for these flexible applications. Okay, thank you. Um, Andreas Freitag um, asked if the presentation will be shared afterwards and the video will be published um, online on YouTube after the session. Okay, um, thank you again, Mrs. Kallmeier. Let's move on with our next presentation. Um, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Moulin from Indianapolis. And, and Mr. Moulin works as a medical market segment manager at Specialty Coating, uh, Coating Systems. And SCS is a world leader in polyurethane conformal coating services and technologies um, with over 50 years of experience and elf coating facilities. Today, he will be sharing his expert and opinion on Parolin as a conformal coating for advanced medical devices. And with that, I ask that you give your full attention to Mr. Moulin. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, there have been some wonderful presentations, so I'm excited to share with you a little bit about a un unique material that some of you may be familiar with, and that is perylene conformal coatings. This is a quick agenda. I won't spend too much time going through uh, the details here, but we're gonna talk about some of the needs for conformal coatings and how perylene fits those needs. Talk about some select properties, but I wanna spend a little bit of time at the end to describe some specific medical examples where perylene is being currently used. There are many needs for conformal coating, specifically in the medical industry. The two primary needs are the first two bullets here, moisture, chemical, and fluid barriers to protect the device from the body, but also the body from the device, have good dielectric strength or electrical insulation, and remain biocompatible and biostable. Some considerations when choosing a conformal coating include not only the properties of the coating itself, but whether there are other things that you need to keep in mind, such as whether there are application temperatures, curing temperatures that are needed, how that affects the material of the device. If curing forces exist, then how can that be a, a positive or negative influence on the performance? Whether thickness control is, is critical and or complete coverage, if there are some regulatory or quality issues as well. Um, of course, wanting to know purity, freedom from byproducts, biocompatibility, biostability, and whether or not the coating can withstand various sterilization techniques. Which brings us to perylene, which is a shortened way of saying polyperazylalene. It's an extremely thin conformal coating that's deposited in a gas phase process, which I'll demonstrate put down at room temperatures so the substrates see no elevated temperatures. It's very flexible. It's a polymer that goes down very thin so, and it's very pure as well. A lot of people ask, well, what's so special about perylene? Well, it's been demonstrated as a very useful material for long-term implants, for electrosurgical devices, various types of uh, examples that I'm going to show you near the end of the presentation. 
has extremely good barrier protection and electrical insulation, has a very unique dry lubricity characteristic as well. And on the right hand side at the, at the final bullets, you can see there are various certifications for the Paralines. And this goes across all markets, but specific to medical, we have the USP class six and the ISO 10993 qualifications. I'm not gonna go through each of these variants, but we'll note that the variants specific to medical are Paralines N, Paralines C, Parafree, which is a newer variant, and Paraline HT. I do wanna say a few things about Parafree since it is fairly new to the market. For those familiar with Paralines, you'll recall that Paraline C has the best barrier properties, but Paraline N has the highest electrical insulation capabilities. The development of Parafree brought both the best of those two variants together in one called Parafree. It's a halogen-free Paraline variant <clears throat> with extremely high dielectric strength and very low permeability to moisture and gases. It also includes an improved thermal conductivity characteristic that can also be very useful for some medical capabilities. We've put this through quite a few various tests, uh, including the IPC830, which is for uh, electronics, but also the biocompatibility testing, ISO 10993 and the USP Class 6. The USP Class 6 is the United States Pharmacopeia, and that's essentially to store and maintain or contain pharmaceutical materials. This is a quick chart to show a few capabilities of the paralines, and I've highlighted in the center here, parafree. You can see the dielectric strength for paraline N is, is the highest at 7,000 volts per mil or, or 25.4 microns. Parafree specifically matches this at 6,900. And for water vapor transmission rate, remember we said paraline C was the best barrier at 0 0.08. Parafree just about matches that at 0 0.09, very, very low water vapor transmission rate. This is a very brief discussion of how the perylene film gets deposited. The parts are loaded into the deposition chamber. It is a batch process. The starting material or dimer is loaded onto, into the left-hand side of the system called the vaporizer. Everything is brought down under vacuum and the vaporizer begins to heat, which sublimates the dimer. And then it moves into the pyrolysis section, which is preheated. The heat imparts enough energy to crack or cleave that dimer molecule into very reactive monomer molecules, which travel into the chamber and deposit on all surfaces in all directions. It's a very uniform film. I have a demonstration here of a, an SEM micrograph at 10,000 X magnification of a one micron perylene film on a silicon comb structure on a wafer. And as you can see, even around that sharp corner, Paraline maintains a one micron uniform thickness. It's very impressive coating. We talk a few uh, about a few properties. Electrical is primarily uh, one that people think about when designing in for uh, many of their electrical devices. Dielectric strength tends to be that first property they think of, and you can see the values for the paralines here at the top. Also important for many designers, especially for wireless technologies, are the dielectric constant and the dissipation factor. And you can see the um, key takeaway from this slide is that across various frequencies, those behaviors and values for the paralines do not change. And this is an, a very big advantage for people who are designing uh, electric devices so that their behavior does not change when used at high frequencies. High frequency testing has been key to the development of Paraline, specifically the Parafree, where we tested not only up to the one gigahertz range, but from 10 to 70 gigahertz as well. And we determined that the dielectric constant and the dissipation factor or loss tangent factor showed no changes. They were very stable throughout that entire test range. So if you have some interest in uh, Paraline as a high frequency material, please contact us and we can share some of that data with you. High frequency is important specifically for application specific integrated circuits that require high gain, low power dissipation, uh, high quality factors and low loss transmission lines. As you can see here, 
that goes not only for radio frequency, but midwave or midwave technology as well for programmables, uh, for all wireless technologies. Many of the things that we've heard spoken about uh, in these presentations during this great conference, these are uh, specifically critical for some of today's leading implants that will communicate with medical practitioners outside for continuous monitoring and alerting as well. We talked a little bit about barrier properties. This is a chart for water vapor transmission rate or WVTR as you may hear it called sometimes. Uh, the red bars are for the perilines. You can see they're all very low compared to many other uh, common materials used in the medical industry. And we, we talked about perylene C and parafree having the best or the lowest uh, values for water vapor transmission rate. We see that here. Now, perylene is used across many markets. As you can imagine, it's a very versatile material. Uh, and many of those, those markets are listed here. I'm going to speak specifically about medical and how well suited perylene is for that market. It has an extremely long history, decades long history of use with the various regulatory agencies around the world, not only for surface and externally communicating devices, but for implants as well. In fact, that's probably where it finds its, its greatest home in medical. This is by virtue of the demonstrated biocompatibility that's been done on the Paralynx, not just by SCS, but by customers who have tested their finished devices and have them approved in the market over these past 20 or 25 years. It is compatible with the most common of the sterilization methods <clears throat> and would need to be in order to be approved uh, for use in a commercial manner. Uh, SES also maintains both drug and device master files so that for our coding service customers who submit to the FDA, we provide reference authorization to, to uh, those files on behalf of their submissions. We also work with notified bodies across uh, Europe and the other regulatory agencies globally as well. So we provide that kind of support for our coding service customers. These are uh, a simplified list of the ISO 10993 tests that the various medical paralines have been put through. Uh, the three tests in the center are those specific to the USP class six designation. Uh, these test reports along with many other materials reside in our FDA master files, uh, but we are certainly willing uh, to work with any regulatory agencies that uh, you perhaps are engaged with across the globe. I'm gonna go through some medical examples. This is where my, the most interesting part for me is. Uh, and these are the main categories I'm gonna to touch upon, maybe a slide for each infusion, electrosurgical, various electronics, things to do with the heart, things to do with uh, neurostimulation and neurosensing, which we heard uh, some very interesting things about just recently here in, this, in the conference. And also just some simplified uh, uh, examples of, of elastomers like seals and O-rings that we'll go over. In the infusion world, we have anything that introduces liquid into the body. That can be uh, blood transfusions, that could be medication administration, it could be nutrient solutions. So we're talking about needles and syringe technologies, all kinds of uh, components that go on into those catheters and uh, introduction systems, the IV systems. Blood warming technology is also very, very critical, especially for those in uh, intensive care units who need transfusions or who need extra blood during surgical processes. Uh, Glucose and uh, diabetes treatment is growing across the globe. Paraling finds a very useful home there as well. And it has also for many years been part of different pharmaceutical ampules and containers and uh, administration systems. The applications are primarily surgical and clinical uh, for diabetes, chemotherapy, dialysis, antiseptic containment, etc. Syringe technology, even pre-filled syringe technologies rely on perylenes for their dry film lubricity, for barrier properties. Uh, in the dry film lubricity, we talk about uh, making something seal up the very uh, uh, non-dense pores, the porosity of a, of a, for instance, a silicone uh, material. It also provides very uh, easy cleaning of those surfaces. And I'll, I'll mention that again here when we get into surgical. 
the different uh, electrosurgical devices that are used today uh, have been a tremendous benefit to medical treatment as well as to patients. When you can perform a procedure laparoscopically, you reduce surgical site infections, you reduce this residence time that the patient has to be in the hospital, their recovery time is much quicker, they can often recover at home, many, many benefits for uh, electrosurgical uses, and uh, particularly for the types listed here, radiofrequency, resistive uh, combination, we have midwave, even cryogenic. And perylene has been useful in cryogenic technologies as well because it maintains its flexibility at cryogenic temperatures. The applications are general surgeries, cardiology, as you can see here, urology is a, a growing market as well, uh, women's health treatment, anesthetics is also. And the main attributes being the electrical insulation, the barrier properties, and dry film lubricity. Of course, everything always needs to remain biocompatible and biostable and, and be able to withstand the various sterilization processes. Electrosurgical and electronics are very closely related, but uh, there are many electronics that are not part of electrosurgical technologies, including printed circuit boards of various kinds, uh, multi-layer and rigid and flex circuits, flex circuits being a growing component of electronics in medical. We heard a lot about various types of sensors. Um, Paraline finds itself a home on many, many sensors, especially catheter mounted sensors, uh, as well as any other type of sensors that are used to monitor the ongoing health of the patient. Imaging is uh, the second bullet here. Ultrasonic transducers technology use, utilize perylene on a very consistent basis. X-ray scintillators are very, very hygroscopic, meaning they like water. Perylene provides that barrier property to keep those scintillators protected so that they can continue to provide the imagery that's necessary for the doctors to use. The applications are across all disciplines. And again, at the bottom, we see here those key properties, electrical insulation and barrier properties. Again, those are, those are Im immeasurably important when uh, protecting the devices that have to work correctly every single time and be reliable to the practitioner. In cardio, we have a couple of different types of applications. Not only are the traditional pacemakers, uh, ventricular assist devices and implanted units protected uh, by perylene, but we have the stents as well. Now, perylene provides a very useful uh, mode of, of use on stents, not only coronary stents, but cerebral stents and those used in the carotid artery and the abdomen. It, it provides an extremely uniform base layer that is used as a tie layer for the, uh, the attachment of the drugs that are used to prevent restenosis, which is the reclosure of the, of the vein or artery. Um, Paraline is also used in development of bioabsorbable stents. <clears throat> the bioabsorbable stent itself is uh, subject to um, disillusion at a rate that's perhaps not easily controlled. So perylene acts as a very thin diffusion layer to control that dissolution. Again, perylene attributes at the bottom for elect uh, cardio, electrical insulation, barrier. You're gonna see these same characteristics across almost every application when it comes to uh, advanced medical technologies. Neurostimulation, we heard just a little bit about that in the last presentation. We have different types of uh, components within neurostim. That are, that are used that need insulation properties, uh, implanted pulse generators, the probes themselves, the deep brain stimulation technologies, which are commonly uh, associated with perylings. Neurostim is used for a variety of wonderful applications, including the reduction of pain to reduce opioid addiction, uh, the treatment of epilepsy or tremors, uh, Parkinson's disease, um, in, incontinence, very wonderful technologies that can be used to avoid the use of drugs. And again, we see the very similar perylene attributes there. Okay, sorry, Mr. Marin, you have got only one minute left. One minute, okay, very good, thank you. Thanks. Uh, neurosensing is very similar to neurostimulation in that electricity is used to locate nerves so that either the doctor can administer um, anesthetic very close to where it needs to go 
or they can avoid nerves when they're delivering tools to, lo to the locale that's needed for the surgical techniques. And then last but not least are elastomers, where we have a variety of different types of, of molded parts. I'm gonna go quickly through these last three slides. One would be for endoscopic port seals where the tools that go into the abdomen need to create the right seal so that the abdomen can remain uh, expanded with gas so that the surgeon can see what they're doing. This even goes into surgical uh, robotics where not only are those seals required, but all these cables and tubes rub across drapes and different components during the surgery and the dry film lubricity that Paraline gives provides a nice gliding surface, believe it or not, so that it's, it's, uh, un, it creates an uninhibited movement of the devices. It also uh, results in a very nice surface to be able to clean between procedures. So in summary, I'll just uh, let you read these bullets and invite you to join us at our booth or perhaps to just contact us at scscoatings.com. I'm gonna throw up the last slide here, which includes my email. Invite any questions uh, or interest in Paraline so that we can continue this conversation later. So with that, I'll say thank you. Okay, thank you for this very interesting presentation. And um, time is almost up, but, but we have time for one last question. And um, one question I have is, um, is it possible to work with SCS during product design? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, Paraline goes everywhere on the parts. So oftentimes when a product is developed and there's a problem with it, they ask about the use of Paraline. That becomes the solution looking for a problem, but we'd much rather work during the development of the part so that we can design the right way in which we can apply Paraline so that we can reduce costs and make it more effective for the customer. So we have many engineers who work with our customers engineers on the development of products. And that is by far the best way to find the most optimum solution for the customer. So thank you for that question. Thank you for your answer. Um, and thanks again for your presentation, Mr. Molin. And um, our next speaker is Markus Funk, who works as a managing director at Beuter Precision Components. Um, Beuter is the specialist for fine mechanical components of high manufacturing depth in small series um, and besides mechanical engineering and measuring instruments technology, they supply all areas of medicine technology. And today he will be talking about what do medical technology companies um, expect from a supplier. The screen is yours, Mr. Funk. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Foster for the introduction. I hope that you can see my um, my screen. Um, yeah, everything is good. Okay, I would like to start. Um, yes, what is the topic? What are what do medical engineering companies expect from a subcontractor? I would like to talk a little bit the view of a subcontractor. What are the challenges for a subcontractor when working with medical engineering companies, especially from a regulatory standpoint? And I have split my presentation in three parts. First of all, I would give, like to give you a quick overview of our company Beuter. Then I would like to tell you a little bit about the general um, requirements, quality management for subcontractors. And at the end, the third part is a concrete example where we, where we work together with, with two customers, um, how that worked um, on, on, on concrete examples, uh, especially here for, for um, uh, cardiovascular um, applications, uh, Rhein Watt and Rhein Hart are the customers here which we worked together. So let's start with the overview of the company. Beuter is a very old company, already founded in 1901, uh, 1991 as a watchmaking factory. Today, in 2020, we are 111 years old and we are now a, a subcontractor for high precision mechanical components, uh, mainly from difficult to machine materials. What does that mean? That means we are uh, specialists for 
um, for materials like titanium, for um, stainless steels, for special alloys, and also for ceramics or, or peak. So everything which is a little bit difficult to manufacture. And we are working here in, in normal uh, production runs between, I would say, 20 and 5,000. So that means in a small and medium range um, size. And we are serving different uh, markets here. Um, uh, a very important market, which we're also talking today, is the medical engineering, medical market. But we're also serving for um, applications in mechanical engineering, in aviation space, and also in, in measuring technology and a little bit in military. What is very important, we have about 150 employees and we have a very high portion of skilled workers. We are we have a, a big production and we have a skilled worker range of more than 85%, which is very important for the high level of products which we are manufacturing. And we are located in, in Rosenfeld in Germany. Rosenfeld is a town approximately 80 kilometers south of Stuttgart, so it means in southwest of Germany. What are our main technologies? Um, we are a CNC manufacturer, so we have all classical CNC technologies in-house turning, milling, grinding, and honing. We have about 50 different machineries, mainly CNC uh, controlled. And um, I would not like to go in too much in detail now, what, that, what are the, um, the competences here. When you when we have a look on our homepage, www.beuter.de, you will get all the detailed information on that technologies, on that possibilities. Um, what, we, what we serve in addition is um, uh, some uh, processes like fine deburring and polishing, which is very important. You will see later words for the quality of the of the implants of the products. We also do some assemblies, and we have a, a quite um, high sophisticated cleaning and also packing process. We are able to pack here also in clean room, clean room ISO class seven. And what's what we also serve is some already in early stage of development, uh, support for our customers in design and engineering if they need it or they want to have this support here. Then we have a quality, regarding quality, we have a very well equipped test center here in our location. That means we can all measure what we are producing. We have 3D metrology machines. We have special me measurement equipment for shape and position. Um, laser measuring devices, X-ray fluorescence. So we have a very, um, a very precise measurement equipment. So we are able to measure up with, a, with the accuracy of one micrometer for length and diameter and 0.1 micrometer for shape and position. Certificates, so we, it's, it's more or less clear. We have to have the 13485 for medical um, applications and the classical 9001, and we also have for the aerospace, the 9100 certification. So what are the applications which we are working on? Um, we are looking in the medical engineering mainly for products with a risk class 2B or 3. So that means the highest, the highest um, challenges, the highest requirements on the, on the products. You see on the right side, some pictures of samples which we made in the past or we're currently producing. So we have a lot of active implants, which we're uh, producing components like cardiovascular acid devices for blood pumps, some, some crucial components for artificial hearts, hydrocephalus valves, urinary incontinence valve, and also port systems. So a, a wide range inside the, the implant, active implants, which we are producing components. Furthermore, we are producing some components for osteosynthesis and endoprosthetics like pedicle screws or femoral nails and also plates. We, we, we producing some orthotic and prosthetic components and we also uh, producing um, com uh, complete um, instruments for, for special surgery. Um, applications like what you, you see this picture here. It's a self-retaining screwdriver, which we developed to, together with a customer of us. So you see there is a wide range of different products and where we are um, working on at the moment. So now I will skip to the more or less the regulations in general. What is, what is the base for regulations which we have to follow? Um, as you all probably know, there are these uh, new MDR regulations which um, were um, 
issued in 2017, this 2017 745, which was uh, well, already planned that it will be implemented or effective with May 20. Now it's postponed to May 21, but this is the, uh, the main regulation where the, all the manufacturers have to follow and the subcontractors um, are in the second step, they have to follow what the, what the manufacturers will, will tell them or what, what they will need. So this is the main, um, uh, the main standard, which is the basic for all our work with our customers. In addition, it's the, 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 the ISO 13485 in the edition of 2016. 2016, this edition, there was a big change in the, in the requirements uh, compared to former editions. Um, the, the view on the, on the risk, on the risk, um, risks were, was was came up in a much in a much higher focus than before and uh, it more or less um, separated from the original ISO 9001 so the focus uh, went much more in in the direction of the US equivalent standard which is this 24 CFR H20 which has the current good manufacturing practice which has a much much uh, uh, more uh, intensive look on the risk management. So this is what came up with the 13485. And this is something which we have to follow or the customers of us have to follow and we have to follow together. As you probably all also know, there are four classes, different risk classes, class one, two, A, two, B, and three. Um, the higher the number, the higher the requirements or the, the, the risk, um, the, the risk occurrence here, uh, so we, we, as Boyder, we have a focus mainly on products for class 2B and 3 with the highest um, requirements, the highest challenges here. And um, wh what we have to do is here, we have together um, with our customer, we have to, to um, look what, what, um, what, what risk level we are uh, achieve. There are two, um, two different characteristics, it's the damage degree and the probability of occurrence. And clearly the target must be to be here in the down left area, probably a low damage degree and a low probability of occurrence. So we have to, to work together with our um, customer that we, we fill the records and find uh, define everything that we will come up in as, as much as possible in this low left level of this risk matrix here. So now I come up a little more in, in, the, in the different documentation and the different steps which we have to follow when uh, development uh, uh, and producing a product. First of all, when, when uh, development is starting, the design is starting, it's clear every step, each step has to be recorded. What has developed, that's mainly a job of our customer because we do not know or not, not know so much at the beginning. And very important is that it's not only recorded what they have done, but also why they have it done and, and um, how they have it done. And so that means they have to start um, very, very detailed um, documentation of every step in the design, in the de development, which um, stops then sometimes in a, in a design freeze um, when the development is more or less closed. At this time, uh, all processes all, and also design have to be fixed and um, more or less change after that can only be done with high effort of additional documentation. So the design freeze is a very, very important step in that process. Um, after the design freeze, when we go into the manufacturing processes, uh, we have to look that everything is reproducible and re reliable and everything is according to drawings and specifications. And that means uh, a documentation during the production is a, a part of production process is, is very important. And we have the same requirements here that every, every uh, step is here always um, with, a, with a look or with a view on, on not only why, how, but also why and by whom and, and uh, how it has been done. So then uh, the, the, the quality of the product have to be somehow verified. That means a classical verification. That means uh, some measurement or tests of the, of the parts um, during manufacturing, as well as uh, for the outgoing products. It's clear um, everything which is not documented is not existing. So every, 
every result has to be documented. It's not only be done by measuring, but it has to be documented. And uh, uh, a very important topic for verification is um, the, the point of the validation. Uh, the validation of the process steps with these four um, different uh, kinds of validation, design qualification. That means the first step when the, is the system in general suitable, then installation qualification, operational qualification, at the end of performance qualification. This has to be done for every process step uh, which we have. Um, that means every, every production step and, um, and also every test step. Um, Sometimes there are some steps which are not so easy to validate, like manual steps. Um, that then, in that kind, something has to be, in addition, verified by measurements. Um, but this is more or less a, an, uh, uh, yeah, this is more or less something special. But in general, we need this valid validation documented for every process steps we are doing. So, in the last very. Um, important requirement is the traceability. So all the time, everything has to be identified um, and have to be secured that the whole process during entire production is uh, traceable, that there is no mixture of parts, that then uh, all the problems could be avoided. Um, and if non-conforming products are uh, occurring, that they can be controlled. So, um, and if they occur, that it must be sure that they can be identified and separated during production and also later at the customer in the market. So traceability is, is a very, very important topic here too. So now I, I switch to the, uh, to the examples with our customers, which we have done. Um, I have here um, two product examples, the companies Rheinwatt and Reinhardt. Um, these are spin-offs from the Technical University of Aachen. Rheinwald started in 2013 and Reinhardt in 2015. And um, these are both um, support systems for the heart, for the, for the blood circulation. Um, the Rheinwald system, it's so-called um, a left ventricular acid device. So it's a, it's a partial support of the heart. And uh, for Reinhardt, it's a complete artificial heart. Um, both of these um, systems have um, external support for the for the for the um, for the pump system. And I would would not like to go too still too detail in the function of these of these um, products. Uh, maybe you can have a look on on the homepage of Reinhardt and Reinhardt, where it is much better explained what these um, products are working, but important is what, what we are doing. So I will skip this um, slide here. So what we're doing here, Poido has or is producing some mechanical components for these systems. Um, material is here, um, mainly um, this high strength alloy titanium grade five, and also some parts are from, from peak, thermoplastic peak, which also have a very good biocompatibility in the, in the body. So these parts are mainly produced classical with CNC manufacturing and then also some additional processes, lapping, laser welding. But uh, we also have, um, we have this challenges, which we have is the, the production itself. The tolerances are not so tight, but we have some warpage um, tendencies at these very thin walled uh, products. And um, we have to look for cylindricity and um, find some production strategies that we have a, um, a reproducible, uh, stable production. Uh, but besides the, 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 the dimensions at these parts, it's a very big um, challenge, the, the surface, which we have to uh, create here, because it's, it's very important that there is no burrs on the parts, um, a high surface quality, because to prevent um, um, the, the damage of the blood here. Um, so we need um, some, um, some areas which are rounded and other ones are, have sharp edged. Uh, so this is, we, it's not possible to manufacture these parts just with, uh, with CNC machining. There is also some, still some manual work uh, needed uh, because of these selected surface qualities inside and outside. So this is a, a high, uh, a high challenge for, for our workers here. We have here really long skilled, good skilled workers to do this manual work also 
on the parts and uh, we have to, to uh, um, achieve somehow surface qualities with roughness below 0.05 micrometers to, to follow or fulfill here the requirements. So from the validation... Sorry, I interrupt you. You have only one minute. Okay, um, then I... Uh, yes, it's the last slide. I, okay. I would just so very, very important is that we um, already defined all the processes, uh, validated processes to produce these parts, support our customer with the with the with the needed documentation, with FMARs, with with validation documents that uh, the customer um, can can bring these documents to the notified body and get the approval. We are now in the prototyping status at the moment, but we are prepared for doing uh, the zero production later on also for these products. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you would like to have more information, please show uh, our booth on the Combamate and uh, have a look on our homepage, www.boy.de. Thank you very much. I'd like to express our express, uh, appreciation of your most interesting talk. Thank you. Um, one question I have is, uh, how do you manage the qualification and validation of additional manufacturing machines, um, for example, for the increase of capacities? So this is a, a very good question because this often appears. So um, from a standard, from a regular standpoint, you have to qualify each machine uh, separate and in addition, um, even if it's very similar than the already existing machine. But sometimes we have agreement with customers if, if the machine is the same, the base, same base type and it, there's no difference, it's just a, a twin of the first one, then it, uh, I would say an easy approval is, is, is possible. But this is somehow also uh, a di dialogue with the customer. Um, but in general, you have to qualify every machine uh, and validate every machine for, for itself, even if a cap in a capacity addition. And um, how do you support your customers in creation all or, um, of all required documents for product approval? Okay, we have a, a wide range of, of different types of, of documentation, like FMERs, like validation documents, like um, pro, uh, measuring protocols, um, uh, flow charts. So there we have, a, I would say, a wide range of templates of standards which we are serving here. Some, sometimes the customers have their own documents and we are able to also fill them then with a dialogue. Uh, but I would say we have a lot of young, long year experience and a lot of documents which we can serve with the customers. Okay, yeah, thank you for your detailed answer and thank you again for your presentation. Thank you very much. And our last speaker for today is Mr. Markus Müller who is team leader of product management at 3D Micromag. Um, three Micromag, a uh, leading supplier of customized laser micromachine system, develops and manufactures state-of-the-art laser micromachining workstations for industry, research, and science. And today you will be talking about drilling, cutting, structuring, from micrometer scale to roll-to-roll -roll mass production with laser. Here I, I'd like to turn over to Mr. Markus Müller. Hi. Thank you. I hope you can listen. I hope you can hear me, actually. Yeah, I can hear you. So uh, what uh, Dr. Baum didn't mention, I think he's from Chemnitz too. So we have a bank holiday today in Saxony. So we are the only state in Germany who are doing this. So it's a pleasure to be with here with you guys around here. So I will share my screen. So one moment, please. Okay, hopefully you can see my presentation yeah. now. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So I want to talk about drilling, cutting, structuring from micrometer scale to a, to a mass production with laser. So my presentation uh, will start with a short uh, introduction of my company actually. Then I will show you different applications on uh, micrometer scale and mass production. And I will go over to uh, mechanical or, or some applications for medical applications, which we are doing with our customers at the moment. So as you can see on this slide, we have we are founded in 2002. We have at the moment 170 employees 
and we are actually based in the middle of Europe in Chemnitz. So we have some branch offices in the US. So we have a sister company there, the 3D Micromag LLC. And we have some offices in Taiwan and China as well. So what we are doing, we are um, yeah, a mechanical engineering company actually. We are doing studies and process development in our house. We are producing different machines for all kinds of application. The only limitation we have is we need to use a laser actually. So all our machines are actually somehow installed with a laser. Uh, in these years, we have uh, 500 installations of our machines worldwide, and we have uh, yeah, some special semiconductor industry machines and some special uh, machines for display and electronic industry. So I will show you what application we are capable of. As you could read in my uh, title, this is about laser structuring, drilling, and cutting. So you can see on the pictures different uh, applications for this. And the laser structuring, for example, is the patterning and structuring of thick, of thick layers. This could be different kinds of metals. This could be glass. This could be foils. This could, uh, so different kinds of materials. The laser drilling, uh, especially for nebulizer nozzles, I will show you in my presentation later on. And laser cutting as well is for marking and structuring of different glass substrates for various life science application, actually. I will show you on the next slides as well. So these are the applications I want to know, or I want to show you today. And we also have all kinds of different other applications. So we have a laser lift off uh, applications, for example, micro LEDs or some display applications. DMP, this is uh, micro laser sintering. So we can sinter uh, some metals with the laser. This is a very good uh, method for the production of micro metal parts, actually. And we, are have, we have a laser engraving module, and this is for marking of transparent materials, for example, glasses for, yeah, glasses actually. Uh, these application we can actually apply on different substrates. So you can see this is uh, four different kinds of substrates. So in the left top side, so these are millimeter uh, probes for uh, sample preparation. So with our micro prep, this is a special laser tool for sample preparation. Uh, for example, in medical application, it's very interesting for uh, different kind of materials somehow uh, titanium alloys or uh, some other alloys which you want to see in SEM or TEM to watch if this is if they have the right quality for your application. So we can do this actually, some TEM lamellas or whatever. On the left uh, bottom side, so we have uh, all kinds of chucks for different wafer level uh, applications. So this could be silicium, this could be a glass, this could be also uh, for photovoltaic applications. In the middle there, you can see big panel application in glass. I want to show you in the next slides actually. And on the right hand side, so there is a world to world mass production tool or a modular tool concept, which we are capable of. And we do this for medical application, other application. So as you can see, our company could do laser uh, structuring, patterning or whatever on all kinds of substrates actually. So I want to start with the medical applications. Um, so in medical laboratory, so there is always the need of these uh, yeah, class slides you can see on the right hand side, but how do you get these class slides out of a big class panel? So this looks quite easy. And I think everybody who is listening knows somehow a technique for cutting off these slides into the, or the big panels into these slides. And the classical way of this is actually the scrape and break technique. So you make a mechanical cut of the class. And as you can see on these both, pic both pictures, this is a low cost application actually 
but you also have a low flexibility and the edge quality is also very low. As you can see on the left hand side, there is a top view of a glass and you see the edges are not quite good. And in the cross section on the right hand side, you can see actually this, that there are glass chipping is on top on the uh, glass visible. So what we are doing actually is a filamentation uh, technique. So you're starting uh, to cut these glasses with a short pulse laser and the filamentation starts with a high focused laser in the glass. So you have all kinds of, um, yeah, you have a yeah, changed glass surface and this goes down into the glass and I want to show you actually a video I hopefully it you can you can watch it right now and you can see the laser is the black box on top of it and you can see the, the short pulse laser starting uh, to cut or, or start to uh, make uh, some kind of filamentation in the glass this panel you can see here is two meters by one meters and our uh, facility or our, uh, yeah, what we can do is three meters to two meters. After the, uh, yeah, the filamentation process, you can, the class come out there, you can see the beer slides on top of this or the class slides, and then you have to break it out with the class or well, with different techniques. What is the separation process in step two? Uh, I think, yeah, you can see it here. It goes quite easy and you can separate it mechanically by hand or you can we can we have some solution for automatically separation of this and then you have a, a main advantage to other ones i want to show you in the next slide what is the difference between the classical and the filamentation process you can see on the right hand side the laser filamentation you have a very good edge quality actually and there's no chipping uh, glass chipping during the process uh, with this Low cost, low cost technique. So actually, we have a cost of ownership of this, so around one cent per slide. So you got really good uh, edge quality, and the correct direction is defined. So you have no deviations during the separation. What is also a big plus to the classical way of doing this. What can we do with uh, other applications, especially drilling, I want to show you in the next slides. So nebulizers for truck delivery, we did this with a company, but I can't go into detail because of NDA restrictions. So sorry about that, but I can show you this uh, nebulizer. Uh, on the top left, you can see what is, uh, the nebulizer is doing. So it's for truck delivery for different applications. Um, we produced this. Uh, with a technique, uh, at first there is a nozzle cut it out of glass. So this is what you can see uh, with bigger holes because uh, otherwise you can't see the holes uh, right now in the glass. So on the top left side and in the middle, so these holes we are, we're cutting in we're three micrometers in diameter actually. On the uh, bottom left side, you can see these different kind of shapes for those nozzles, but this is only the nozzle. To do this nipulization, actually, you need a foil which uh, is doing the, yeah, the, the nebulizer as, as well. So this foil is out of P, a polyimide or PI foil. And we are cutting this PI foil or drilling some holes in there with our mass production tool, a roll to roll actually. So this concept is a modular machine concept uh, with 3D Micromag is doing the core competences. So we have uh, standardized modules for the unwinder, the rewinder, and in between there are individual modules for cleaning, the laser cutting, drilling, structuring, and a quality control. And in addition, we have with different partners a cooperation so we can put in modules about coating, trying, or packaging. So we have a very modular uh, concept for uh, the world to world mass production. I will show you in the next slide actually what is the, the yeah, we, we did it for our uh, medical device manufacturing on flexible carrier substrates. So you can see here, I will, I think I will stop 
around here. So actually, this is a sensor on the left-hand side uh, for, yeah I, yeah, I can't go into detail about this because of NDA's distraction as well, but these sensors were used in medical devices for human application. And our laser process on this wool-to-wool -wool mass production starts with uh, pulsed laser. So this laser pulse is about uh, 100 shots per second, up to 150 shots per second. So I can go on with the video. And what you are seeing, what you can see in the video, actually, it starts with, um, with a mask in front of the laser ablation. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, with the laser ablation. And you can actually see this mast is the, yeah, the, the sensor substrate. Uh, what is the sensors looking like? You put this mast in front of the laser. And actually then is this uh, mast is cut out of the PI4. So I will show you in the video, you can see it. So this was only the introduction of it. So this was a special application with 150 shots per second. So every shot is one sensor actually. Uh, and this you can see in here, there is the PI foil actually on a substrate. This is unwinded and rewinded on the machine. And then it goes through a cleaning process and through, uh, yeah, actually through the laser module. You can, this is the quality control as well. And on the back, you can see there is there are the sensors coming out on this foil. So this is a really, really uh, big mass protection of these sensors. And we have a 100% quality control of all areas of interest in there. What is the main uh, advantage of this? So we have, uh, yeah, the main advantage is we have very good um, control of the resolution of these structures. So we can go down to th three micrometers of structure sizes. And the position accuracy of the PI4 is around 25 micrometers. So you can see the positioning is quite accurate. So I think we are the most we have the most accurate uh, positioning system at the market for this around here. And we have 100% quality control of every sensor. And as you can imagine, so 150 shots per second. So there are a lot of uh, sensors to be measured for their quality control actually. And you can take the ablated material actually for a recycling process. So what is cutting out there, you can take it, the material and you can recycle it actually. So I think this was my last slide today. So I think, I, so I thank you for your attention actually. So thank you very much. And this is the last fall for me. So thank you for the audition. And I hope you have some questions for me around here. So I'm, I'm in time, actually. So that's good yeah. to me. Yeah, thank you for the interesting presentations. Um, one question I have is, what are the main advantages of laser as a processing tool compared to other mechanical tools? Uh, I think, oh, thank you for the question, actually. Uh, I think the best way to explain this to you is when you meant, when you think about my my uh, presentation about cutting of the class slides, so there are two different um, yeah things to do this cutting process, but with the classical way of scribe and break, you generate uh, class particles actually during the process, and you don't have this with the laser. So when the laser after the laser process, the whole class panel is clean, and you don't need an extra uh, yeah, trying process or an extra cleaning process. The other thing is for some other techniques in, the, in this special application, you need uh, to clean it with, for example, water afterwards. So it's quite a break as well. So, but this has a negative effect because when you have classes, so as what you could see in my video was uh, some classes without coatings on top, but they, actually we can do this with some different coatings on top of these classes. When you do a cleaning process, 
you can destroy your coating on top of that. So with the laser, you don't have any of these problems. So we can cut these things with, uh, with a coating on top. We can cut very thin glasses and you have all kinds of application or you can do all kinds of application with the laser as well. Okay, thank you. And let's say I'm looking for a solution for my application example, um, how you can support me with that? So uh, I think 3D Micromag is actually a solution provider for all kinds of processes and all kinds of problems. So most of the time we are starting with a blank sheet and we are starting to get over these points from our customer. And then we are starting to make a process development. We can, and then we build a machine around the process actually. So what we can do is we provide a solution for this. So come to me, tell me your problem. I think we find we will find a solution for this. On the other hand, we have an application lab around in our facility, and we can do a lot of tests for all kinds of application. So yeah, we support you in every step from start from starting of your process to ramp up your production, and then we can do a lot of batches and uh, controls and we calculate all about it. So I think the best way to describe is come to us, tell us your problem and we find a solution actually. Yeah. Thank you again, Mr. Müller, for your answer. Um, Thank you very much okay. to be around here. Okay. Due to the fact that we haven't got any questions for the moment, I would like to thank you all for your interesting presentations. Um, thanks to all who joined us today, thanks to all speakers, and thanks to all who are in the live stream at the moment. If there are any questions for any speakers or if you want something to know about IFAM, visit our digital showroom or visit our website. IFAM is going to connect you with um, all the speakers. Don't miss the microfluidic session tomorrow on the virtual Compamed High Tech Forum. Um, and the session um, starts at... 11 o'clock. Thank you.